Okay, today is a look at the potentials that play a role in so much of our universe, both large and tiny. And uh, the Coulomb field is definitely part of that, but we're going to uh, do something that uh, you may have seen in uh, sophomore physics, namely the idealized sophomore physics Earth. This is a chance to get us to see two potential fields sort of moving each other, move into each other. The outside 1 over r type potential with 1 over r squared force field moves into, as we go into the uh, ideal Earth gravitational field, uh, changes to a harmonic oscillator uh, with a r to the first power force field and uh, our familiar quadratic kr squared over 2. Uh, potential. And this gives us a chance to do something that, um, well, it's kind of fanciful. <coughs> We're going to imagine a piece of nuclear matter oscillating in the center of the Earth and discuss how possible that might be, but mainly it's going to let us uh, segue into uh, the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, uh, the simplest wave uh, that you can have that's not trivial, and uh, that's the bottom here. That's what's going to be the next lecture, but this is a chance to get uh, both a feeling for the mathematics and bookkeeping that you do uh, for such an object, and also later when we discuss quantum mechanics of Coulomb fields a little bit, um, stuff that we do today will play a role. Uh, the other thing that I really want to get you to have is a good feeling uh, for both the mathematics of some curves and also the physics of some units like electrostatic, gravitational, black hole sort of uh, uh, constants of, of, uh, of, the, of the physics. So um, the first thing I just want to look at is a really simple uh, idea here and um, it's where the, uh, when you speak of a geometric series, this is where the geometry uh, comes. The um, idea of an exponential is built into this as well. So the idea is you have some number, s in this case 1.5, and uh, you, you want to display on, the gra on, a, on a graph like this the powers of that uh, number. Um, you know that the uh, number to the zeroth power is just simply 1, and therefore, as most of our graphs uh, do, there's a y equal x line that uh, is key to making the graph work. And all we do here is uh, on the uh, number one vertical, that is x equal one is a constant all along that line, um, I draw a uh, line from the origin through that point and extend it. Uh, to the edge of the graph paper. And then, it's just a matter of saying, okay, uh, whatever that number is, I'm going to read it off of the graph, in this case 1.5. I draw a vertical line using the graph paper, so this is something you can do uh, without a compass or any sort of uh, what would be needed to get a, a, a horizontal or a vertical line. And then, uh, when it hits the red line, you go up to the uh, line that you've already drawn. And that uh, there, since this is a, uh, a line y equal s x, I just put uh, x equal s into that equation by uh, doing that this little zigzag there. Uh, so this uh, would be s squared. And uh, I could go ahead and write it here. We can also take it down uh, to this point just to make a record of it on either axis. And then the next zig zag now is going to be s cubed, and so forth. So there's your geometric series, uh, a rising series, uh, on a piece of graph paper. It's a staircase. Okay, has anybody ever seen this before? It should be a 
something that you would learn. Uh, the first time you heard terminology, geometric series, there is the uh, or sequence. Uh, there is the sequence. Uh, the series is of course a sum. Now this continues the other way. Uh, there is s to the minus one, right there. There is s to the minus two, minus three, and so forth, getting very tiny as we go down into the edge. Now this is not too different from the plot that's on the blackboard that we worked on uh, last uh, time uh, and the time before that. If you just draw your attention to this uh, thing here, where in this case the sequence was that of fractions getting smaller and smaller. Very similar uh, in some ways to this, this one. Now, um, one of the things that's uh, cool about this is that uh, uh, actually plotting a curve, at least parts of the curve, uh, that represents the equation uh, y equal s to the x is easy to do. Once we've, we've found uh, various powers of that, then we simply assign uh, a point to uh, whatever uh, for example, this one is easy, that's 2, 1, but this one where uh, I have s squared here, I just go across till where it is 2 and put a dot, you see, and then uh, s cubed, okay, well that's the altitude, but then there's the 3, so I put a dot right there, and what you have uh, produced by doing that is an approximation, that is a, a shall we say, a subset of the points that lie on the function y equal s to the x. Okay. Okay. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do as a, um, a homework um, is to do this, and also, once you've done this, if you just reflect the thing around the 45 degree line, uh, it turns into the curve y equal log base x of x. The base s, excuse me of x, you see. So there's a symmetry here between the function and the inverse function, and that would be true of, uh, of any two, uh, a y of x function, any two, a single, single independent variable, a single dependent variable uh, function. So uh, that is uh, you know, kind of neat, and, and these points, of course, uh, and the curve itself are a uh, part of that. Now, in the, in the uh, beginning of this, in the preface, I mentioned that our toolbox gets more and more sophisticated as we go down the line here until finally we're using all of this high-powered uh, uh, modern computing equipment. But uh, before that came the calculator, and before that comes the graph paper, and before that comes these things used by the ancient navigators. Well, we're kind of using them all now. And uh, to do the the thing that I want you to do, and that is to get very uh, chummy with the exponential function. Everything that happens in the relativity that we'll do, and in the quantum mechanics that is really married to that relativity, and we'll see how that marriage goes, uh, is based on uh, exponential functions. The universe is an exponential exercise. Everything it does is behaving in more or less explosive or de-explosive ways. It just can't seem to control itself, although it does uh, quite well for a while. But in any case, what uh, we do here uh, to, to do this, and I've made some more graph paper and put it on uh, line, or I think TC has uh, put it online, just a big piece of graph paper that has no labeling and covers a 8 by 10 uh, page. The first thing you do is use the bottom, near the bottom of the, of the toolbox and find the actual numerical value of, of E. And then you, uh, I, I think you, you catch on right away that this graphical stuff we're doing here uh, is really not using the fourth figure at all. And uh, neither is it using the third figure really, even with a graph like this, kind of stuck here with 2.7, maybe 2, or 1, or you, you, it's really hard for us to get the third figure when you're doing a graph. So um, when, you, uh, when you become a teacher, uh, 
in the future, I think you're going to have to more and more make an effort to, to remind your students of how incredible it is to have that many figures and have it be right. And we're going to talk about this number. It's an incredible number and the functions that go with it are absolutely necessary to, to understand deeply in order to carry on uh, the work we'll be doing later on. But one of the things I would like to point out about this number, I think you notice that it goes 2.718281828, and that's as far as this calculator carries it. So if you saw that for the first time, you say, ah, this is a repeating fraction. This is just a rational number. But it's not. The next number uh, after that is not one. Okay, so I thought that was kind of, kind of cool. So there you're talking about all these figures that we don't access at, at this level uh, of this graph. Now, uh, the thing that I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead and copy this, but then and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, I think I no, I guess I um, have not even put it on here. But um, what I'd like you to do is figure out ways to get twice as many points. You see, this one, this number is so large that we're very quickly off the paper. But it'd be nice to have a number uh, somewhere in here. Okay, um, it'd be nice to have it right on the halfway point between there and there. Okay and same here, and same here. And it'd also be nice uh, to have a precise uh, indication of the slope at each of these points, and maybe the one in between as well, but certainly the ones that are on integers. I would like you to uh, precisely draw what the slope is uh, through that point. And uh, these, are, these will be surprising discoveries, I think, if you haven't seen this geometry. Uh, explain, uh, you know, exposed. Uh, you, uh, you, it's a neat, it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. This is, you know, the beauty of, of Leonard Yule Euler's uh, discovery, the, the Euler E, uh, the growth, growth constant, nat natural growth constant. So we're going to be talking more about that as we review complex variables, which absolutely need uh, the number E in order to even begin uh, their uh, work. Okay, now, um, let's see if there's anything else that uh, need. Here is that same construction uh, drawn again, just to indicate this was a very big deal in the cult in our culture it was recovering uh, the art, the ability to draw in perspective, which the Greeks had, uh, and then kind of got washed out by all of that bad business between the Greeks and the uh, various other tribes that uh, appeared on the scene, burning of Alexandrian library being the most famous event uh, in that. But anyway, the idea of building a perspective, in this case I picked the scale factor to be 2, a little bit bigger than the 1.5 that we just looked at, so here we're getting powers of 2, and drawing lines across and down, and even uh, going ahead and finishing it with something that's perpendicular to it, that is something that has a slope not of two, but minus the inverse of two, that is minus a half right there, uh, and uh, attaching the various uh, fractions uh, uh, to that that could jive with the fractions that would have come out of this zigzag right here. You see, this is just another zigzag going back and forth uh, right here, okay? So these two zigzags sort of are on a, on a fan blade that's at right angles. That is, this green line here is perpendicular orthogonal to uh, that, that one. So this kind of looks like a um, hallway, okay? Hallway in public school, middle school, whatever. In fact, the way I like to say that is if we go over to this one, where I've taken the scale factor down, this is what you see on your first day of perspective in first grade, say, then you grow up, and this is more like what the hallway looks like as a 12th grader. Okay, so it's all your perspective that uh, 
uh, that makes your uh, memories and whatnot, and, and your way of viewing things. Now, when we're, we're going to be next time looking at oscillators, uh, oscillators that uh, make orbits, and um, the effect, the Kepler effect of slowing down and speeding up on a elliptical orbit is based on basically the perspective uh, idea here, the scaling. And, and uh, that corresponds to conservation of angular momentum, is something we haven't mentioned uh, yet. We've talked lots about the first axiom of linear momentum, but that will uh, be part of the story, and it's rather beautiful to see that. So we'll take that on uh, uh, next time. Okay, now, um, I'd like to get into the geometry of a, of a parabola, uh, both because it is what makes the oscillator potential that we, in physics, know and love because we can really solve all sorts of things about it analytically, and uh, it also plays a role as an approximation to uh, the various dispersion functions that we're going to work with in quantum mechanics and uh, relativity. And the uh, parabola is a sort of a singular uh, feature of the, what are called conic sections. The ellipse on one side and the hyperbola on the other. And we'll run into those in a number of different ways as we go along here. The ellipse will show up uh, next time as an orbit, um, a two-dimensional oscillator orbit. And the uh, idea here is that uh, each parabolic point is found by a single uh, zigzag. Basically, you uh, have here uh, x equal 1 and y equal 1. That's the 45 degree line here. And I'm trying to plot y equal x squared. And all I do is go out here uh, and say I am questioning what the value would be uh, on the hyperbola if I were to uh, you know, have the uh, point x. And uh, the <coughs> basic idea is to uh, just do the zigzag from its y equal x intersection to the x equal 1 line. Uh, so where that intersects, you go to that point. And then uh, <coughs> you zag from the origin back to that uh, particular uh, point, okay, back to that line through that point like that, bingo, that's the uh, uh, value of the parabola, and I put a little dot uh, line of the parabola up to that point uh, there. So that basic idea is the, the zag line is y equal the question mark times x, and uh, it hits that line at the y equal question mark squared. So that's just to repeat of what we were doing with a geometrical series in one step. In any case, it works uh, either side of uh, those uh, lines there. If I want to do it uh, uh, inside there, uh, it's the same uh, uh, trip. I go there and uh, find the uh, parabola uh, <coughs> with a zig and a zag. There it is. Uh, and this is a whole bunch of points. And this is where uh, we want to really use this for a, 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 a oscillator potential that goes with a hook law force. So there's the force law uh, over there. And in this particular case, um, using the basic idea of, of force being the slope, the ratio d or delta u to delta x, uh, that the triangle, the similar triangle, uh, right here. In this case, I've taken the uh, one half and one half of the force to be proportional to uh, delta. X. That is, this is a similarity. This to that is that to that, or vice versa. That over that is equal to that over that, and the one halves uh, cancel. See, this is what we did before when we had the animations, and we we had this uh, constant line that uh, would uh, get longer or shorter depending on what the slope was of the normal to the curve, to the curve that was um, being uh, traversed by something that was following a potential. 
So this is just a parabolic example of that spilled out with a couple more details. And in this case, it's such that you can actually read the force off just from the distance right here. And so that vector there, actually this one, if you're going that way, uh, is the same as this one. All right, that's kind of neat. But uh, the real thing that we need uh, for the parabola is a little bit more sophisticated. This is uh, uh, this and the little thing here where I'm plotting. Uh, various arcs uh, to find the, the, the uh, what's called the directrix is summed up more or less uh, by this. This is a standard uh, development of the uh, parab the geometry of a parabola. And just out of curiosity, how many people feel uh, that um, this is not a surprise to them? They've seen it and remember it. Um, Tim, you seem to. Get these things fairly easily. And that is this not something that you have in your permanent memory. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna go through it. If there is any kind of have you seen it once? But it's just one of those things that comes in one, goes out the other. T C do you remember? Satellite antenna dishes. Say again? Satellite antenna dishes. Well, yes, or telescopes. I mean a you mess with those things. This is this is your baby, right? Um, if you're uh, interested in the focus, right? That's where that comes up. Okay. So you do you remember the, this from your education at all? So you seem to have a pretty good feeling for it. We're going to make some use of this. So these. So it will all mean something uh, before you're done uh, with this course. Uh, uh, Marley, does this make any sense to you? Do you remember seeing it at all? Uh, not in middle school or high school? All the light rays are going to go to the focus. They all... There comes a ray. Okay. Now the catch is the, the ray has to be <coughs> parallel, periaxial as they say. Okay. So, so this if you is get one system. in your backyard, you can yeah. melt a GI Joe or whatever if you put it right at the focus point. If, if you, yeah, if you have one of these things and you stick it in your hand, they're going to burn. <laughs> so don't do it. But um, yeah, that's the way our, 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 our fancy solar heaters are working now. They have whole cylinders of these things and they follow the sun. The heat things. Yeah. You, you, you've ever seen this? Okay, well, have fun with it. I mean, this is stuff you can have fun with. It's really cool. And, uh, no, have you, have you, I'm surprised. I mean, I'm um, a little dismayed by our secondary schools. We're trying to do something about that. But um, it, this is the kind of stuff that if you were in Europe, uh, you know, you'd be able to take an exam on this. And uh, I'd like to get you to that point. Uh, uh, too, so that when you come to the GRE or things like that, there'll be little things that won't trip you up. Okay, well, anyway, the idea, um, and I'd like to show you a little bit more than you get when you uh, look up this on the web or uh, look at a geometry book. Um, I've played with these things for so long, I've discovered some new, nice new ways to, to look at them. But here's the old way. Uh, the basic idea is, first of all, as uh, Al was saying here, uh, is that no matter where a ray comes, it bounces off that uh, surface, angle of incidence equal angle of reflection, and such that it ends up going through there. Now, if this is a reflector on your headlight of your, of your automobile, right, there's a filament or a diode or, you know, all the modern optical systems are making use of the old geometry whenever they can, uh, there the, the light comes out in all directions, you see, light in that direction can be an outgoing thing. And the idea is that it will reflect off of the surface uh, for all angles except where the thing ends, obviously a light ray that goes here, if that's the end of the reflector, it just keeps going and very quickly disappears into the darkness. But uh, 
uh, a light ray going this way is deflected uh, to always come out straight up, they say. So that's, that's a neat thing that we you know, need to incorporate in, into our geometry is that we have an angle of incidence with a tangent line here that is, uh, there's a little tangent line take a microscope to that thing and you, with your calculus of delas and epsilons, uh, here comes the, the ray, it's going to have an angle, that angle right there is uh, equal to uh, this angle. Uh, and uh, that angle is the angle that takes you right into the, the, the focus. Now the uh, way you handle this thing with geometry, rulers and compasses, is to note, and this is something that uh, would be part of any description of the parabola, that if I strike an arc from that point, it will come always to this line. So no matter where I do this, if I have a line going here, and I strike that, that arc, that focal distance, it is going to hit this line, be tangent to this line. So. Uh, the idea that the distance to the directrix of the parabola in this uh, sitting here at exactly the distance uh, from the uh, bottom of the parabola that the bottom is from the focus. So these two uh, right here are equal. They're equal to this uh, thing that's called the lattice rectum. Um, I <laughs> PC that out. Uh, I will always try to call it the lattice radius, you know, though it's the latter that I, I, I remember. A uh, better name for lam lambda is lattice radius, and I like to tell people that the old term is exclusive copyright of the extreme roid rage gym in Venice Beach, California. So forget that one right now. But it's a radius, that's what it is. This is this were a circle, that would be the radius in the parabola is related to an ellipse, and an ellipse related to a circle, and the circle has one radius, and it, it, that, that would be the lambda uh, for it. So all the conic sections are going to have this, this lambda for lattice radius uh, that uh, describes how high the focus is uh, from the uh, whatever the curve is, uh, perpendicular to the symmetry axis. Let's see, anything else here? I think that's um, really all that you would normally learn about uh, this uh, beautiful curve, the parabola. But uh, there's more, and it's what I call the kite. As long as uh, this is equal to that, why not bisect that perpendicular bisection, draw it down to this point, it will cross the uh, what I might call a semi-directrix, or just the line that touches the bottom of the parabola, that is the axis, uh, a horizontal axis of the parabola, is uh, this line, and it will strike it at a particular point that gives you uh, the slope of the tangent. That is the tangent right there. Uh, it's because of angle of incidence equal angle of reflection. So as you uh, go up and down the curve, uh, as long as you stay away from that point right there, that is, if you cross the lattice radius uh, in, uh, uh, point, uh, then you get some pretty weird uh, kites. That is, if you are right at that point, on, this time it's on this side, uh, you have uh, not an American kite. This is a very American kite, the old-fashioned old kind. Uh, this is more like a box kite, kind you'd see um, Japan or some uh, uh, of the Asian countries. And they also have uh, rhombohedral uh, kites, and that's what you'll get uh, if you pick a point uh, that's inside, like that point right there, you see. Uh, you get a uh, perfect rhombus, a symmetric rhombus, uh, after you pass through the, uh, the square kite. Well, anyway, this, this is a really powerful way uh, to um, you know, sort of diagnose a parabola if you see one, or to build one if you're trying to build one that has certain properties. And um, the usual equation that's given in analytical geometry books is either this one 
more, I've occasionally seen this one where they use the lattice radius, but 4p is 2 lambda, this coefficient of y, uh, the vertical axis, um, <coughs> is 4p, is, uh, and that's exactly equal to, to 2 lambda, that is, lambda is equal to 2p. So, um, here's the lambda, which is twice uh, the distance uh, to the bottom of the uh, parabola, uh, and twice that distance then is equal to uh, the lattice radius. Now, uh, one thing that you should get from this right away, and that we're going to use uh, perhaps today, certainly in other times, is if somebody gives you a parabola, and it could be one of these really narrow ones, okay, or it could be something that's you know, sweeping a uh, great big geometry. The question is, where is the focus? And uh, the focus has to be uh, opposite the point that has a unit slope. So wherever the parabola comes up to 45 degrees, then back you go to the focus. That, that will be uh, pointing at the focus. And why is that? Because a line coming down to 45 degrees will be reflected, verti be, be reflected horizontally. So vertical line, horizontal line, and it will hit the focus. So any parabola absolutely have unit slope uh, opposite the focus on either side. This is minus one and that's plus one, but we call them both uh, unit slope. So far so good? Okay, that's something I wanted to point out because I think we will use it uh, today as we build a potential uh, inside the Earth, uh, at least a model of uh, the inside of the Earth. Okay, now the other thing that I'd like you to do, this is going to be assigned uh, Thursday, you might as well get used to it. Um, what I'd like you to do is use the geometry and this will be spelled out in both your textbook and this is just a copy of uh, the fourth figure in um, chapter 8 of unit 1 um, to follow the steps where you zigzag uh, back and forth between the x equal 1 line and the y equal minus 1 line to build uh, both the uh, uh, curve that describes a Coulomb potential outside of the Earth, and a Coulomb force field outside of the Earth. And we're using geometrical units here, so I'm talking about uh, the Coulomb force field of minus 1 over x, x to the minus 1 power with a minus sign attached, and then the derivative uh, of that uh, in, it is uh, the minus the derivative of that is minus 1 over x squared. So Basically, I'm going asking you to take a nice piece of graph paper, which we have lots of, uh, both online and uh, elsewhere, and go ahead and build a zigzag construction so you get some feeling for what it's like to change energy going away from a Coulomb source. Okay, and I'm imagining here you see that that Coulomb drops off to minus infinity if it was a infinitely small uh, particle, and we've been talking here about either gravity or electrostatics. And then uh, the derivative of that is gotten by just zigzagging one more time. Each time you make one of the points here, you very quickly do the zigzag to get the next one. So it's, it's a really simple uh, little exercise, and it doesn't take you very long before you have 10 or 15 uh, points that represent what's going on outside. This is the uh, point right here where we're going to um, have the surface of the Earth appear and make a very different potential, namely a parabola inside it. Anyway, the derivation of it is essentially given by the zigzag idea, but then I've reconstructed that, uh, der that derivation uh, right there with the proportionality uh, relations that are uh, shown there. And through all of this, it's the basic idea of the force being, uh, that's the green stuff, the green points, the force uh, function 
uh, being minus uh, the uh, derivative, the delta u over delta x. Okay, so this is the outside of the Earth's radius. This is a symbol for, since we're talking about Earth, it's a very common symbol to draw a little circle with uh, sort of the equator and then a latitude, uh, I'm sorry, a longitude line. Just a little plus sign in a circle is uh, what we mean, what, we, what you'll see. And then if it's a circle with a dot, if you're going to be an astronomer, you know that's the sun, that's solar indications. And we'll talk about the numbers that go with those uh, today. Anyway, I was going to have you do it in class on the board. There's last year's uh, attempt at it on the board right there. And it uh, doesn't take you very long uh, to uh, put this together. Now, this is the part that's a little tricky. In other words, how do you marry a parabola, that's x to the second power, uh, to x to the minus one power, okay? And the idea is to use the geometrical units. We are talking about the very simple geometrical potential function, minus one over x, and then the force function, minus one over x squared. Um, the, those two indicated by red for the potential and green for the force. Uh, are, uh, after you think about it for a while, fairly obvious. And one of the things that you have is that the uh, slope of this one, right at uh, this point here, which is where the Earth comes into, uh, and you, you are hitting the Earth uh, right there, uh, the surface of it, uh, has a slope of 1. So, if we're going to build a parabola that connects to that, and the idea is not to have a discontinuity in the potential, we're allowed to have a discontinuity in force, and there's a big one. It turns a linear, it comes down, bounces up to the origin like that. Uh, the linear force has a quadratic potential, which is this one. So that, that's a little tricky, uh, but this is fairly obvious uh, here. I just want you to, you know, play with this. This is what physics is all about, getting a feeling for uh, you know, how this one goes, and it really takes a long time for this one to go to zero. You go way down the end of the board, you even go down uh, in a parking lot, uh, you'd still have a visible distance uh, between the potential and the axis, but this one, 1 over x squared, gets there a lot quicker. So you see how much quicker, okay? All right. Um, now let's talk about the physics, that's the geometry. Um, in a nutshell. Uh, here we go with um, electrostatics. Let's suppose it's not the Earth we're talking about. We'll get back to the Earth in, in, a, in a minute here. But let's talk about the electrostatic force between two units, MKS units, of charge. Now, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people here have uh, had uh, the uh, UP2? One, two, three. Have you, have you had UP2 at all yet? Well, you won't be maybe a surprise, uh, or maybe you'll be more surprised by what's going to be coming in a minute here. Um, you, uh, Nor, if you, you've had UP2, right? You haven't had it yet? Okay, it's not going to hurt. We're not going <laughs> to. It, 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 you, you can learn it here, and then you'll be much better off when you take it. And, and UP2 for you yet? I'm in it right now. You're in it right now. Okay, and you might know the answer to this question here. How big is this thing? Now, what I'm talking about is the coefficient that gives me the force if I know R, okay? And the idea is that uh, whatever it's going to be, okay, uh, this QQ here, those are the two uh, charges. It could be one coulomb and one coulomb. Suppose it was. And I was one meter uh, apart. I had, you know, a nice meter stick here, and I stick at the end of those, the ends of the meter stick. I put a coulomb here, and I put a coulomb here. Suppose I'm the god of coulombs, and I can do that, all right? And um, I'll make them both the same sign, so it's going to be a repulsion. That's the other thing you have to learn about. Opposites attract, and uh, uh, if they were plus and minus, there would be attraction of this magnitude. But uh, just out of curiosity, um, 
I'll go around the room. First, Tim, do you have any idea what sort of number uh, I would put in there? Uh, Is it like a hundred, a thousand, a million? You know, make a guess if you don't remember. I do not remember. Uh, I will guess uh, 10 to the uh, 4. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'm not going to count against you if you're a, you're a little low. Uh, Matt, you, any idea? Uh, no idea. Okay, no idea. Uh, I'll put a question mark for you. Uh, uh, no idea. No idea, another question mark. Okay. And Marley, you've had the course. Do you remember uh, this one? 10 to the A? That's a guess. You get close. You get close. That's a big A? Mm. That's big, isn't it? Uh, Lou, you remember? What were you going to? I can't do it. Okay, I'll, I'll put a, another sh check mark there. We've got two votes for 10 to the 8th. And you haven't had it yet, I, I, I presume. Uh, have you seen it yet? Uh, I should ask you, because you're taking the course right now. Yeah, it's a. Uh You're remembering the uh, first part of the number, but I'm after the X phone on the 10. Remember that? Nine. Ah. You're getting close. Getting close. Okay, well, they're all wrong, but you're the closest. Okay. The, the, I mean, this is absolutely astounding. It's nine billion. Nine E nine to uh, three figures. This is a very good thing to remember because it's, you know, it's right. It's right within uh, the figures that we talk about. What we're talking about is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. It's 8.987, so that's 9.0. Okay? Solid two figures, almost three, right? 9E9. Well, Let's just round it off like we're going to do for most of our stuff today. Nine is almost ten. This is ten billion. Ten to the tenth. Ten to the tenth we're talking about. This is big time. Now you say, oh, well, that's because the Coulomb is an enormous amount of charge. Yeah, you're right. But one Coulomb per second flowing in your, your car uh, as you start is one amp, you probably have 10 amps easily on, on most of the modern cars, right, when you start the motor. So you run 10 of these suckers through your car every time you push the button. So in that terms, the Coulomb is a very, uh, shall we say, pedestrian, common public unit. But if you gather uh, two of them at the end of the meter stick, Well, you blow up Fayetteville, basically. I mean, this is an atomic bomb. And that's where the energy comes from, both the uh, fission nuclear uh, either reactor or bomb. And this is the way you calculate. You don't calculate with mc squared because you don't know what the hell the delta m is. You use this number right here to estimate the amount of, of, of power you get uh, from a nuclear bomb. We're going to get into that. Okay, that is the uh, way that they, uh, and then of course, uh, um, this is well known to people that build these damn things, but it's not widely known. Uh, and, um, you know, if you go down and ask some professors in the hallway, very few of them get you by right answer. Yeah. Can we relate it to a typical human weight in Newtons? A, 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 a typical human weight, how much the, crap the Earth is pulling on them. Oh, so you mean in terms of, of, yes, to see uh, how that we're going to do that in just a, a bit. I want to get the electrostatics out of the way before we go back and look at gravity. Gravity is going to be uh, very small in these units. Yeah, and, and it's surprising how small. Okay, just as surprising as this is big. Okay, but um, right now I just want you to get a, a feeling for it. Uh, what it is we're talking about here when we talk about a Coulomb. Okay? 
Now, um, and this is something, you see, there, there are good physics books and there are bad physics books, and I don't know where mine falls, but I try and get on the good side. Uh, Feynman's book, the lectures in physics by Feynman, if you want to learn physics so that you can use it and be creative in it, you absolutely have to read the three volumes, and they are free. They're absolutely free. It used to be 150 bucks or 100 bucks at uh, Barnes and Noble or someplace like that, and you get these, these three books. They read like a novel. You just put them by the John and read them while you're on the John, almost. I mean, and learn. I mean, he's he's throwing the stuff at you in a way that I'm trying to do, and that is to get it so it sticks. Okay, and and you have a, a feeling how enormous some of these things are, and how enormously tiny other things are. So uh, that's the game we're going to be playing for the next few minutes here. Uh, that and remembering that plus plus is repulsive, plus minus is attractive. Uh, and, and that's the other magic about charges. It can go positive or negative. Mass cannot do that. So mass is always attractive with equals attracting. So it's a whole different thing, but it still obeys the same 1 over r squared with a bizarrely sized constant. Okay, now let's just take a look and see how many coulombs do we have. For example, how many coulombs are there in the end of your pinky, a cubic centimeter? Okay, we'll take some CGS units here. That's what we're going to, we're going to play with things that are the size of the tip of your uh, 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 pinky. Okay, and uh, I call this fingertip physics. Okay. And this chapter 8 is discussing all this, so you should read it uh, just to get this refreshed. Take a gram of water, and that's mostly what's in here, right? You're 98% water, and Pinky's included in you, okay? So let's just suppose we're talking about a cubic centimeter of water, and that means that we're talking about 1 over the molecular weight. The molecular weight is found by taking the proton and the proton, that's one and one, and then uh, this thing has uh, eight protons and eight neutrons, that makes 16, so we're talking about 16 plus one plus one, that's your basic chemistry uh, way of figuring out the, the what we call gram molecular weight. One mole is 18 grams of water, not very much, 18 cubic centimeters of water. But how much charge is in there, and there's one unit uh, t uh, one, um, shall we say, electronic unit of charge for each of these numbers here. Uh, positive, positive, and we're talking about the nuclei now, okay? And then we're going to, uh, of course, uh, have equal amounts of the negative charge, the electrons that hold this water molecule together, so that the, the, the arithmetic sum of the charges comes to zero. It's better do that. We've got a bomb. But I just want to know how many coulombs of one kind and how many coulombs of the other kind are existent. And let's just take the positive kind. Okay, so it's the nuclei after all. So I'm going one, I'm, I, uh, one eighteenth of a mole has one eighteenth, and then we need Avogadro's number. A mole has, uh, it doesn't matter what the stuff is, uh, six times huge number, ten to the twenty-third molecules. Okay. So what we're talking about is 0.3 times 10 to the 23rd uh, of this uh, uh, number. And then what we have to do is uh, multiply that here uh, by the charge of a single quantum, the electron, or the proton. They both have this number. The electron has a minus. I put an absolute value thing on here. Otherwise, it would have a minus. Uh, 1.6, 10 to the minus 19th. That's not very many coulombs. That's a really small number. But it's going to be hit by 10 to the 23rd. You see. So you've got a whale of a number of coulombs in your little pinky. Not just one, which would blow up Fayetteville, but many times that. Okay? Whew, this is scary. Okay, so we got... Say we got 10 electrons and 10 protons. Let's just make it uh, an easy uh, 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 thing here. Um, we got, uh, let's see if I can, I'm probably going to have to read this off to you. But anyway, let, let's just cut to the chase. You can come back and do the arithmetic. We have, to with one figure accuracy, 50,000 coulombs 
of, electro of electronic charge. And then we have, that's minus, and then we have plus 50,000 coulombs of the proton charge or nuclear charge. Okay? All that in here. Okay? And we talked about how, how you know, one coulomb blows up Fayetteville. Cancel the manicure. I mean, oh, that's just amazing. Okay? Now, uh, let's, let's leave the electric guys behind. Uh, and uh, we're going to do a comparison here between the biggie and the small. Okay, now, everybody's had UP1, right? So, uh, this, these were the guesses uh, for the coefficient of uh, uh, E uh, squared co uh, coefficient. Uh, what about M, M coefficient? That's what we're dealing with here, uh, the gravitational constant. Okay. Instead of this funny little one over four pi epsilon, and by the way, that is a real mystery. It's just out there bugging us. Figure out what what you mean by permittivity of free space. But that's for relativity later on. Here we go with a big G, not little G, which is 9.8 meters per second per second, but big G. What do you? What are our guesses here now? Now I'll start with you, Tim. Uh, Ten to the negative. Not bad. Not bad. You, do you remember it? UP1? Um, maybe 10 to the negative 12 or negative 11. Okay, Close another vote for t 10 to the minus 12. Okay. That's good. Uh, 10 to the negative 11. Negative? 11. Oh, okay, 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 okay. 10 to the negative 11. We're, we're just changing a little bit here. That's fine. New, new, new. Okay, I'll put a check mark on that one. Marley. I'm done. With that. Okay, <laughs> we've got some unanimity here. <laughs> I'll write it down just for the heck of it, because we got to have some outliers, <laughs> right? Nor, he's looking it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you, you remember from yours? Either, either you guys? I don't remember. Sorry. Yeah. Now this is. You see, I'm. I want. I'm going to require you to remember these damn things. Okay. But I'm making it easy. Um, <laughs> what about you? Got eleven. Minus eleven. Yeah. Okay. We'll put another check mark on that one. All right. All right. The answer. The answer is. Two-thirds of 10 to the minus 10. Isn't that wild? Now that's of course just, uh, you know, round off, all right? And the other thing you should know about this is this one is, we've got this one out, uh, quite a few figures, I, I think uh, eight or nine. This one, these figures are garbage. This is about as good as we can get it right now. I think that's going to change. But right now, we're kind of stuck with about four figures. And that is really close to two-thirds, right? So you, you can uh, do your estimation uh, pretty nicely uh, with the two-thirds, uh, 10 to the minus 10, uh, in your, you know, your work. Two-thirds times 10 to the minus 10, okay? So it's not quite 10 to the minus 10, but wow. This is 10 to the plus 10th. This one's 10 to the minus 10th. There's 10 to the 20th. Now, this is just MKS units, you understand. If you use natural units where they set the, the Coulomb thing equal to 1, okay, they're free to do that. But then you have to do screwy stuff with space and time, okay, which is okay. But MKS, whatever it uses, and that's what you get with MKS, is this incredible, really shows the difference between these two. How incredibly weak this gravity uh, thing is, whatever it is. Of course, you know, we're feeling it all the time. It feels pretty heavy some days, right? A little tired. But uh, you don't get to feel that very much. You comb your hair uh, on, a, on a dry day and you make a spark. Uh, you're, you're, you're feeling pico coulombs going uh, back and forth, making a little shock. Okay. So uh, these are the things. Now, 
in the actual universe as we look out there, especially now that we can look out there with gravity waves, we realize that this dominates. This stuff is nothing compared to what this can do because there's so much mass available to crunch all of our forces, all of our electrostatic, all of our nuclear, all of our internuclear, just completely destroy everything that nature wants to make as we build a black hole, as the universe builds a black hole. We don't do that yet, fortunately. Okay, well, um, I'm going to get this one uh, up there uh, to the point where uh, we can talk about uh, some of these things. So, uh, in this uh, act of comparing uh, these, um, there, there is the um, actual comparison. But now, uh, what we'd like to do is look at um, what you would have as far as potential energy. Okay? Same constant, it's just the units are different. This is a unit of energy per square coulomb. Uh, that we're talking about here. This was force, which was uh, uh, Newton's meter squared. That's because you have an inverse part up here squared. Uh, that's to cancel out and get you Newtons. And then per square coulomb, you have two coulombs uh, sitting uh, here and here. And I see I made a terrible uh, mistake. I don't, <laughs> how did I ever let that go by there? Um, the, we're talking about kilograms here per square kilograms. Those are the units of mass. Okay? But this one's okay. Now, uh, when it comes back to the electrostatic, which is what we're going to do here, because I want to get into the uh, atomic physics and chemistry uh, aspects uh, that occur uh, with these things. When you talk about a uh, atomic size, uh, you're talking about um, basically an angstrom. That's the diameter of the, um, the uh, uh, hydrogen atom, the simplest atom. Okay, it's just about, and, and that's fuzzy. As we're going to see, it's, it's, a, it's a wave that's peaked around a, a, a nucleus that is much smaller. The nucleus is much, 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 much smaller. And that's Rutherford's, uh, beginning of Rutherford's great discovery. It's a, how terribly tiny uh, the nuclei are. And you see 10 to the minus 10th meters, that's uh, angstrom, or uh, uh, <clears throat> 10 to the minus 10th, a tenth of a nanometer. Okay, nanometer is a unit that goes around this hallway all the time. A nano building over here means they study things at nanometer size. Uh, well, atom is one tenth of that. And if it was a nuclear physics lab, we'd be studying at, look at, a hundred thousandths, one over a hundred thousand of the size of the atom is a typical uh, nucleus. One or two or three uh, femtometers, 10 to the minus 15, okay, remember that. Also, uh, this can be capitalized. Uh, one Fermi, named you know, after the great American physicist, Italian American physicist, uh, Enrico Fermi, who developed all the nuclear physics that is applicable. Anyway, a big molecule is like 10 angstroms. I'm thinking of my favorite buckyball, which is up on the shelf there. It's actually a 10 or 11 or 12, depending on how you measure it. But um, we're talking about 10 to the minus 9 meters if we're talking about 10 angstroms, one nanometer. And uh, that's quite a bit bigger than hydrogen, 10 times uh, roughly uh, bigger than the hydrogen. So we can get some idea how much energy are we talking about when we put um, two of these things close to each other, say they have the same charge and want to fly apart, <coughs> that's a chemical reaction, uh, giving off energy uh, would do it that way. Or a bomb, if you build a, something that decomposes uh, its electrons. But what if you decompose the nucleus, you see? And therein lies the difference between the amount of energy you get from a a chemical blast as opposed to uh, from a fission blast where you, uh, the nucleus starts vibrating and pops apart. That's the liquid drop model for the dynamics that gives rise to that. So uh, here we are talking about 
uh, tiny, tiny, tiny. I couldn't even draw it on this graph here. It'd be less than a pixel by far, right? If the uh, this were the uh, atom, okay? Well, what that means is the nuclear radii are 100,000 to a million times smaller than the atomic chemical radii, and that means that the nuclear energy is that same factor times larger than that that would be associated with a typical molecule that dissociated. That is, half of the ch uh, charge went this way and half the charge went that way, like trinitrotoluene or nitroglycerin or something like that. It literally comes apart, that's a high explosive that just explodes because the molecules came apart. Not a, an explosion like gunpowder where some chemical reactions occur and there are flames and the heating. Uh, that's a much weaker explosion. This is the best that chemistry uh, would typically do in terms of giving you energy. Well, the nuclei are doing it that much bigger. So this gives you a feeling for uh, the difference between what you get uh, from nuclear energy and what you get from chemical energy, but quite apart from all the other things that you get from it, which may not be so nice. Anyway, uh, what I want to do now is talk just in the last few minutes here about the Coulomb field inside, and it's not called Coulomb, it's called an isotropic harmonic oscillator, IHO. Uh, and it's, uh, well, let's just look at it from various points of view. First of all, why do we have that? And this is something I'm just going to breeze through. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, the idea is, and this is the best I can express it, is, if you, it is to have you imagine for a moment that some sort of weird force has caused the Earth to become a shell. That is, all of the mass that is distributed more or less uniformly in the uh, Earth was pushed so it was completely hollow and we had a really massive crust, very dense crust, super dense, uh, almost nuclear matter dense a crust, uh, a sphere that had a shell. And I had a manhole cover here which uh, I pull aside so that there's a dark hole right in the floor there, okay, that I can, I can fit through, okay, just like a manhole out in the street, right? So imagine what happens as I, you know, open that thing and, ooh, boy, that's a long way down, right? Uh, I, I stick my feet in a thing and, you know, brace myself on the edge of the, of the thing and, and lower myself. And as I lower myself, I find myself getting lighter and lighter and lighter until finally, just as the top of my head goes below the thing, I can let go and just suspend myself. That's what the conclusion of the, uh, I'm trying to show you here, is that anywhere inside that shell, that fantasy shell, okay, there is no gravitational force at all. And the reason for that is, reason you're weightless anywhere inside there is that the distance here is squared to figure out how much mass is pulling you from that direction and so is this distance here squared you see and the distance of course is in the denominator uh, of the force law so if the mass is going as the square of little d squared d squared over d squared little d squared over little d squared for that one and big d squared over big d squared for that one these are two opposing forces this one pulling me uh, trying to pull me this way and this one trying to pull me that way you see equally they're pulling but everywhere I go every time I do this and this is sort of a picture of how you would do the integration to prove that it was zero even after you integrated over the entire sphere zero is what you get. So, one thing you wouldn't want to do is let go and push, right? Because you'd start moving, whoa! And there's nothing you could do, right? There's no, you know, unless you could really move your arms and there is air in there that you could, you know, fly, get back to that manhole uh, and, and climb out. Uh, you're gone, right? You're going to China or wherever, in Australia, I guess. Okay? So, um, that is the conclusion 
of this. And the conclusion goes further and says, if you're inside the Earth, say halfway or a third of the way uh, from to the center, okay, uh, the only thing that, the, that you, you feel uh, there is the mass that's below you. Gravi gravitational force at an R that's less than the radius of the Earth, that's what this symbol is supposed to mean, uh, is just that of the mini planet of that radius. That is, the mass below here is going to be attracting you, you see. So if I build a tunnel in the Earth, and I don't have to worry about heating from all of the incredible magnum that's in there, uh, I will uh, go in that tunnel. As I go further and further in here, I get lighter and 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 lighter. And finally, uh, the, in the tunnel, assuming it goes all the way to the center, the center, obviously, uh, there's not going to be any gravitational force. That is very easy to see. This is a little more difficult to see that it would be that extreme, but that's something that you, you uh, uh, can get used to pretty easily, I think. Uh, and it's true for all sorts of Coulomb forces, that 1 over r squared is easily canceled. So here's the deal. The force uh, inside the Earth is given just by gmm over r squared, just like all uh, Coulomb forces, except that it's r less than the r that is the value you're located at, and we're only interested in the mass less than. That's the key thing right there, because that's getting smaller as you go further in. Okay? So what we do is we go ahead and multiply and divide by 4 thirds over 4 thirds pi uh, to make a volume. Okay? And so what I'm doing here is making a density, a density associated with uh, Earth, which is assumed, and this is why it's called the sophomore physics Earth, that we assume a uniform density. This is a constant. Uh, rho Earth. Okay, we're going to figure out what that is. It's interesting to see what that is. Uh, but in any case, uh, once I've done that, I'm left with GMM 4 pi over 3, and I'm only left with this R here, you see. The, uh, the, um, I've got R cubed, uh, down here, and uh, let's see if I've um, got something missing here. This was r uh, squared, and then I put a uh, cube here. Let's see. I did something weird here. Uh, the idea is that this comes. Oh, with this called rho Earth, I am simply left with uh, a single r. I had an r squared here. I made it an r cubed and multiplied by r to get the r squared in that form. And then that is a constant right there, that thing. Okay? That's Hooke's Law. And we'll see later that this is mg times a ratio of where you are to the actual radius. And that's what we're going to call x. That, that's a, a dimensionless distance. That is what you plot on, the, uh, on that graph uh, that we're uh, uh, going to be doing. Okay, so uh, the surface gravity then, if you go right out uh, to this thing equal to uh, uh, the radius of the Earth, that's when these constants all should pile together to make the, the gravity that you're feeling right now, 9.8 uh, meters per second per second, isn't that, shouldn't that also be there? That should definitely be there, so that's another uh, typo there. Now, obviously not a velocity. Anyway, let's look at some of the constants that uh, you get to play with if you're doing astronomy, local sort of astronomy, solar and earthal. <laughs> uh, here's the earthal stuff right here, radius, okay, 6.37, 10 to the 6. Ah, oh, even I might be able to give them some practice, remember that, 6.4 to 10 to the 6, that's pretty that's not so bad. This one's really nice, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. It's very close to that. It's amazing. MKS just comes out uh, giving you things that are easy. Look at the sun, solar mass, 6955. What? That's 7. Okay, to, you know, for one figure, all right? And that's what we need when we do cosmology. We get things to one figure, uh, if we're lucky. Um, 7, 10 to the 8th, 7E8, okay? And this one, best of all, 
solar mass. 2 times 10 to the 30. 30 is, remember, that's what the age upon which you're, you cannot trust anyone over 30. That was what we were told when we were growing up. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, here are uh, the, the constants that, you know, if you're just going to estimate the one figure, this is the kind of uh, thing that you can use uh, just to get an idea on what's going on. Now, the actual calculation or drawing of this thing right here, that's a parabola. I recommend using the kites. That is, the kites will be giving you lines you can very precisely draw it. I don't require that, but I, I, sh I think you should be aware that that's a possibility. And that the focus is right there, because this is slope 1 at that point. Okay? So this is, this is, this is really cool. Uh, to come in here with an inverse force law and then have a nice uh, quadratic force law uh, just ma married to it, that is having the, the same slope, but the slope of the derivative is not continuous at all. If this were really true and this was an Earth that was absolutely uniform density, I would notice right away that my force was going down linearly if I just went in the basement or down in a tunnel somewhere. Okay, particularly in the tunnel, because we're kind of above the Earth here. So I would still be going down but, uh, in, in um, uh, the uh, force. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the force, which is negative, would be going up. But then it starts going positive again, if the Earth was perfectly uniform. So, uh, in fact, it's not. We, we live on a crust of fluff compared to what's inside uh, the Earth. So we don't get to uh, experience that. Anyway, there's the uh, construction that makes it really easy uh, to draw um, precise a uh, parabola. Okay, now I want to look at uh, just some things that are true about this part of the thing as well as the outside uh, part. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to breeze through these fairly quickly because I think these are things that are better for you to study yourself. But anyway, when you take uh, mechanics courses again or whatnot, there's some helpful little things uh, here. This is the geometrical part. This is the part where I say use 1 over x minus 1 over x for that, minus 1 over x squared for that. Okay? Um, that is um, the outside part of the, uh, of the thing uh, using the space coordinate. And then you rescale that. The x is the is the geometrical, unitless uh, variable. Here is the actual thing. And um, that means that x is this radius divided by the radius of the Earth. That's the dimensionless thing again. Okay, so um, potential energy, we're going to write uh, PE like that, minus 1 over x. I always call it y. All right. Um, that, um, is an expression which, with the MKS variables put in, now has the actual numbers we talked about, mass of the Earth, uh, a mass of an object. The mu here is just a mass of us, either a satellite out here or somebody exploring the Earth inside. We're going to use a neutron starlet for that job. Okay, well, remember escape velocity from your mechanics? That's where we calculate that. Setting kinetic energy, that's the velocity you need to go all the way and stop at infinity sort of thing. That's a, a useful fiction to uh, talk about. Uh, it's simply the potential energy that you have to climb out of from here up to there on an energy scale. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to uh, stop here uh, since um, it's probably worthwhile spending some time on uh, the rest of this particular section where we put it all together, inside, outside, and all of that. The um, main thing that I'd like you, uh, you don't have to do anything really until Thursday, but then you should start on actually building some of these uh, uh, curves just to you know, cement the, uh, the feeling about <laughs> these enormous or these small uh, forces. Okay.